Welcome to the Going Green podcast. And today we're going to have a look at the fact of, well, are we mining ourselves into extinction? You know, are we going to run out of metals, or just certain metals, in the next few years? You know, basically, you know, how much metals do we have left? Um, one of the topics that I have to teach in GCSE chemistry, and this is a really good sort of thing to try and show on a podcast, but if you're watching this on video, you can see, and I have this little book here, and this is the book that all the teachers will use teaching uh, GCSE chemistry. And what it does, it gives a couple of sort of little charts. And it says, basically, these were done in 2010. And it says, well, what's it going to be like in, and they chose 2036. Uh, and not, hmm? not long now. No, no, it, it, it's nearer than it was. And it basically said, with a whole load of different metals, what's the likely picture of how much there's going to be left and it has some really bad numbers like gold will be depleted by 2027 mm. and it and it go and it <clears throat> obviously it goes through and paints a picture as all the common metals are being used yeah and one of the things that not that they didn't take into account for was um three i wouldn't say important things but three things was firstly was the recyclability of some of these materials like um well i don't think we did as much recycling back in 2010 as we're doing now and things have changed yes yeah. so so there's there's firstly that thing secondly it, assuming the rate of i say production or the rate of consumption you know depends on how you put it but essentially it's how much we're extracting out of the ground at a given rate so let, let's say you extract one ton of per day sort of hang out and you've got the four you know four four hundred tons here it could take you four hundred days yeah it, and it, after four hundred days it, you haven't got any left exactly so it, it's taking sort of that in the consumption or the production of say the metals into account of sort of how much we've got left and how much we've got consume uh, we consume and sort of basically taking the difference and there you go that's how many days left of stuff we've got to make and of course the third thing is how likely or how reliable is the figure of determining how much um i say stuff we've got because you can remember that although we look at sort of the minerals and resources of the in the earth's crust you've got to remember that we're only so far so far have yet to mine barely one percent of the total volume of the earth's crust not anything in the middle no we're talking literally about the earth's crust only one percent so far so and i think that could be an overestimate yeah and and so you're sort of saying well where what what is do we need and where is it sort of the useful bits of it you know it's sort of like a cake machine you know, you're trying to find the the good you know nuggets of gold or the out of the rest of it so a good nugget of gold is a good analogy here paul for running out of metals yes well funny that um so anyway in the picture of these things that that's the uh, these i say graphs these ideas were constructed and basically presented as sort of well you know at the current sort of how much we've got predicting you know, how much gold we know in the world is there you know we've got you know and how much we make it better or how much we produce of the gold ore is how much we got left yeah there was something very also very interesting there one of them the metals they listed in 2010 was cadmium and you know how likely we are to run out of that but if we look at that nowadays cadmium's not really so important it's not one of those metals that if you like is on the endangered list and the reason it's not is because well we're not using so much because batteries have which were relying on cadmium are now shifting really toward lithium and in the 2010 survey lithium wasn't even considered on the list you mean 2010 not 20 yeah i was close yes 2010 it wasn't considered on the list 
because we didn't really use enough. Now, of course, it's become put on this so-called endangered list. So which metals are we likely to run out of? So this is something that we're going to have a little look at. And on that subject, we found that uh, when we started doing some research on this, then last year in July, the UK government published their resilience for the future, the UK's critical mineral strategy. Something we'd actually missed, really. Well, yes, and 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 basically, what what it basically defines is what are the critical minerals, and so these are minerals with high economic vulnerability and high global supply risk, and then they move through and say what's on our watch list, and these are minerals that are potentially increasing critically due to the rapid growing demand or emerging global supply risks, and then it's other important metals, and these are sort of feedstocks for important technologies but have more plentiful and commonize and but have bulk of application and provide a degree of flexibility in a market or less risky supply chain so there you go direct from oh, yeah that was a good sentence that wasn't it yeah it's not not very um i wouldn't say readable but it's understandable what they're basically saying you've got your criticals you've got the think it more the animals you've got your endangered list and then you've got your sort of risk list and then you sort of, sort of in too abundant that they need to be cold. Um, yeah, it, it's, and that's where they basically assign the same system to the minerals. And yes, so they have released their little list of all the things. And I can say that cadmium is not on this one. It's not even on the watch list, which is the, or imp, important minerals. Because of course, we've moved from cadmium battery we moved on to lithium and i can tell you that funny enough lithium is on the endangered list or the critical uh mineral list and that's because of course we're using lithium ion batteries and the major important part of that of course is with electric car cells and how much battery uh, they're using of course is then how much they require well, one of the one of the interesting things is for let's just take a country, and I'm just going to choose the UK as an example. In this country, we produce certain minerals, certain metals. Uh, we're well known for our iron. We started this basic sort of industrial revolution here, based on iron and coal, and basically, we've got plenty of that. The one metals that tend to be on our critical list are the ones that we don't have, that we rely on another country to produce. And let's say the world supply of tungsten is in China, then if China decide that they're not going to export any tungsten to the rest of the world, then that's going to make a basically supply chain problem and the metal may become at risk here whereas in a country like china and i'm I'm not saying china would do this but basically uh you smiled at that point um basically we're, we're looking at can other countries hold other countries hostage or worse they can just deny it and they can keep their technology going where other countries are going to flounder well the the, the one of the things about this, an example of this, is actually nickel. And definitely, Russia is actually one of the major biggest countries of nickel ex uh, not exploitation. Production. Uh, yes. And so with the Ukraine war, all the countries shut the borders to, to Russian trade. Suddenly, Russia couldn't export all the nickel. Now, the next problem, of course, is you ask, ah, how where, is, is nickel important? And the answer is, Yes, apparently. It was more significant than everybody predicted. And so suddenly nickel was now having struggled trying to get out into the world. And those small product pro producers production um, were suddenly having to ramp up because, of course, Russia wasn't being allowed to export. Not that they weren't wanting to. They weren't allow being allowed to export the nickel. So they've, yeah, there is this whole inside of 
all this, of course, there is that political of where other stuff is. Yeah, so nickel was going to be, in 2010, the report said, probably by about 2060, so 40 years time or so, uh, nickel is going to be sort of depleted. We're not going to have any nickel left. But uh, you know, what can we say about nickel? Well, nickel is widely used. It's used in things like stainless steel. It's also used in batteries and electric vehicles, which is where basically it's sort of grown in its sort of market share. So, you know, where, which countries then, Paul, have the largest nickel reserves? You mentioned Russia. Well, I mentioned Russia, but I'm... But it's your favourite country, Australia. Oh, yes. Has... And, and Indonesia have equally the large nickel reserves. And that's sort of figured at about 21 million metric tonnes. Uh, we have to remember the Earth's core is probably iron nickel, not that anyone's popped down to have a look. Um, I always like this idea how someone can say, you know, it's made of iron and nickel and this percentage. And I think, mm, yeah, prove it, mate. You know, pop down there and find out. So... Are we likely to run out of nickel? Um, many studies look to say, well, I've seen some that said 2040. Yet others gave me a thousand years. So one of the important things that comes out of this, these are all predictions. They are just sort of looking at, you know, what we're mining perhaps now and not where we might find more resources in the future. Yes, I, I completely agree. It's one of the things, as I said, you know, there is these earlier on the graphs, these May predictions earlier, and things weren't mentioned because at the time they weren't relevant. Now things are relevant. You know, one of the boring minerals that is suddenly becoming very um, important, and it's something that most people go, what, what's that about? Is it something known as, Rather thinny than Rutherfordium. I'll get there. And you're the chemist. I know. And the reason it's really important is because it's boringly, it's a photo multiplier used in the fiber optic cables that make up the internet. And so suddenly you can now see that with the, well, I say the loss of this, but with the very, it's very hard to extract process of getting this rather footium. Uh, you can see that it is this problem that with the more, you know, internet growing as we can see how places are getting connected and those sort of places, it is this issue that no one thought about this because everybody was using copper. And then now we transition to fiber optic because it's faster and more reliable. Then suddenly, yeah, we are using less copper, except, of course, we're not using less copper because we're using copper and all other things. We just, we're not putting them in underground sea cables because, you know, we're using glass fiber, which is a, a better material to do so anyway. So, yeah, we, we're putting copper into places where co only copper can be used, whereas instead of, instead of putting copper down where it's, you know, anything can be used, that's where we're putting it. So... Yeah, so that's the sort of interesting things of what changes how things have happened. You know, you think how many um, copper uh, wires now being are now moving from copper, they're moving to other things because, well... Yeah, do, do I want copper by, uh, to come to my house for my telephone lines or would I prefer fibre? And I do have both. And... Uh, the fibre is a lot, lot faster and technically a lot cheaper because basically copper is expensive. Now, why don't we just try and use copper for what it's sort of good for? Um, and that sort of is one of the things that we're trying to do is change the use. I went out shopping with my mum at the weekend and uh, she wanted some uh, a plug moved. And for that, we needed a bit of wire. And we bought some wire. And she said, what? It cost all that? I'm not paying that. 
And that's just because, you know, a piece of wire costs now you know, quite a lot more than it used to. And and that, that's not to say copper wire isn't cheap. That's just merely to say that it, it's better, you know, instead of putting it in wire, it's better else of other places. So it is... They, well, copper is an excellent conductor, but then why not use gold wire instead then? Well, the problem is that people like gold and they assign a sort of value. This is why you talk about all the, not the stock chains, but you sort of hear everybody talk about gold bullion because it's this nice material and um same with silver but next thing is sort of uh, a use for actual silver is not necessarily in bandages or plasters but it's it's because it's uh, anti uh i say antibiotic it's antibacterial uh as in if a bacteria touches silver it dies uh it's very good at lining sort of not dressings but say bandages and I'm not not cool. But about now you're talking about nanoparticles, and nanoparticles are you know, really small, so you don't need an awful lot. But where was silver used a lot, Paul, until really ten, fifteen years ago? Uh, I was going to say in coins. No, photography. Oh yeah, I suppose. Oh yes, because they were all silver salts to sort of do all the photographic work uh, because silver chemicals like silver nitrate one of those clever things that you pour then onto silver uh, you take the silver nitrate you put it onto your sodium chloride and it makes this little precipitate and if you expose it to light it changes color and that one of those sort of features was used in the photography business for a hundred or so years and cameras were becoming more popular lots and lots of more silver was being used and now if i talk to kids about uh, a camera they immediately get their iphone out yes and, and uh, other phones are available other phones are available but you can see that sort of as we've changed we've used things that develop we found that you know as i say digital is better and so we're not having to use as much silver. So therefore, silver, which was valuable, not valuable, it has become less valuable. And now it's becoming more valuable because we're seeing in its, I say, nanoparticle form, you know, it's not very much of it, but you can put it in things, is very useful for in medicine. So it's just shifting where, in which field or economy or where it was most useful, it's shifted around. Now, in my research in 2010, it said we were going to run out of silver by 2029. You know, that's sort of not many years' time. No. Yet, if we have a look at how much silver is in the world, then, in fact, there's still quite a lot. Now, Peru is currently the largest silver uh, mining country, and, you know, well, what do we use silver for? Yes, you said coins. We've got it used for other things. But basically, um, the silver demand goes up and down. Uh, they are also used in batteries. Uh, but now it looks like, well, we've got plenty of silver left and we're not going to run out of silver in the short term. We're looking at much longer dates uh, for silver. And what I was finding was sort of, well, 20, uh, 2240. Uh, so the, the subtle difference between sort of running out in the next sort of five years or so and thinking, oh, now we're actually becoming much larger. That one of the problems is if I still read reports in 2022, I couldn't find any for 2023. Mind you, we haven't had much of 2023. Uh, but silver um, is sort of set to deplete anywhere from 2030 upwards. And that just goes to show that we don't necessarily know where the silver supplies are. So, yeah, so one of the, the things that you might find... <coughs> in regards to all that is 
you know, and what people think are worth. You know, people think platinum's worth quite a lot. And it, it's a good metal. But yep. we're finding that platinum is actually being used in science for, uh, you know, I say electrodes, but it's also for, for these little, lovely cool fuel cells. And so suddenly a, a lot of demand for platinum is out there and palladium very equally doing similar job. And so we're now trying to find new places for this because we know it's around. But unfortunately, we know that it's very hard to get. You, know, you look at the yield of a platinum ore and it's really low. And so you need to basically extract a lot of rock. And I say this is rock to get sort of a tiny slither of platinum out from all of it. So it's one of those odd things where you might say all this mining's happening just to get a little bit of um, platinum. But that's the reason why platinum's so expensive and they're so costly is because of how much effort was taken to mine this tiny, tiny slither. I, I remember talking about to uh, lots of students about alchemy, this idea of changing base metals into gold. And it, it doesn't work, basically, but we can do it. And <clears throat> I have explained to them that they can take platinum, <clears throat> excuse me, and they can turn platinum into gold. And they think, oh, this could be wonderful. Then I explain to them the cost of the platinum and the cost of the gold. And they then say, well, yes, you are mad here, Philip. So platinum's set to deplete in approximately 100 years or so. Um, yet last year, the amount of platinum mined was greater than the amount of platinum actually used. So we've sort of stockpiled some of this. Um, and, and, and the yeah. major reason because in the fuel cell, the platinum isn't used up. It's a catalyst. And so we don't need constant replacement of platinum. We just need it initially or in the the first time and so suddenly we don't need to constantly get through it yeah one of the other things i was reading was that although we talk about how bad our metal is and how we're going to run out of all this now, a lot of attempt is actually going into recycling all the metals that we use or consume and then throw away because of course metal is not I want to say not consumed. You know, you look at sort of <laughs> how much in the, uh, you know, your your phone. You know, all the gold is which is in your phone. If you've got an iPhone, you're four conductors. You know, that's all extracted back out and then reworked into a new phone. Because yeah, but there's a point there. And one of the things that I ask my students is, how many of you got a brand new phone? And they nearly all put their hands up. And what have you done with your old phone? And the answer is, it's in the drawer. Yes. And they don't like recycling. Yeah, so why don't you recycle it? Well, I don't want to get rid of it, you know, because it, it's got lots of sort of, well, love and whatever with it, you know, but you don't use it anymore. You know, just recycle it. Either sell it on and get some money, or you could just sort of, allow it to be used by someone in the third world. Some of them actually use their, those there and just recycle it and recover all of those rare metals. Because one of the other ones I look at is I show my students a periodic table and I show them a different periodic table they, rather than the normal one. I show them one by abundance and I also put on there which ones are used in mobile phones and they go oh well it, it, it it's silly things you sort of say you ask where are all these you know metals gone sort of you know it's like um a critical one they call gallium you know sort of like oh you know gallium is, is like mercury but less poisonous but not so and but it's liquid at room temperature now why might that be and the answer is, like in the previous generation, we had these mercury switches. Of course, mercury being very dangerous and hazardous and not very good, we are now using cadmium switches. 
and they do gallium gallium sorry not cadmium sorry i'll get the right gallium which and they do exactly the things they detect the the tilt level but instead of doing that we are now just using basically accelerometers now we don't need the these these switches but there is a little bit gallium going around because of course it is this at this room temperature it's very liquidy it's yeah good for yeah. Bit, bit more than room temperature but yeah just yeah, a little just bit. A bit but um yeah in the realms of um technology and sort of things a lot of heat was kicked out it's very good at filling a void for thermal conductivity and so you might solder your lovely um you know, heat sink using gallium to whatever is producing a lot of heat and so there you go there's, there's the reason to use that metal there uh, there are a few technical problems with that pole, but we we won't go into those. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They've worked hard on them. Yeah. So some metals are new on the list, and one of the one of the metals, and it's not one metal, but it's a load of group of metals, are the rare earth metals. Mm-hmm. This is what you were looking at at university, weren't you? Yes. It's all the lanthanides and actinides, and go on, name a few neodymium is one of them and what is neodymium used for magnets and, used for magnets, and, and not just any old magnet really fantastically strong magnet yes and so you see you know therefore there's the use of it i mentioned rutherfordium that's uh basically is the optical uh not the optical the photoelectric photomultiplier photomultiplier which is used in the underground sea cable and so you know it's one of those dumb things from a lot of that is being used um you know there's huge and lots of other ones you know especially used in form medicine and sort of doing all sorts of things but yeah well the all most of these metals these uh, which weren't really anything on the sort of 2010 list they've now got big uses in all sorts of modern electronics and a country that has a lot of these is afghanistan and if you fancy going there and trying to mine it, you're braver than I am. Yes, unfortunately. But you can see sort of, you know, potentially there is this problem of political struggle, which, as we've said before, is a problem of equal rights to the minerals. And the answer is, you know, in the world where we need these things, you know, things might change. You know, there might be reasons to get rich quick. Oh, I said get rich with a lot of investment done and we might have to live with the devil we know as opposed to the devil we don't. Well, China, China's the main country for these rare earth metals and they've got about 38% of the uh, supply. So uh, I don't think we're going to have to worry very much soon on that. So this is basically looking at a whole series of different metals and a lot of scaremongering about, you know, are we going to run out of these metals? And the answer is largely, well, not really, because things have changed. I do want to mention, though, one metal just to finish. Oh, yeah. And that is uranium. Oh. No, just uranium, not uranium ore. Oh, sorry. Okay. Anyway, uranium. And obviously, we're using these for nuclear material. And we're talking about, in 2010, these being depleted by about 2,100. So, you know, there's still a fair bit of sort of uranium left there. But is sort of uranium a real problem? And the answer is, well, no, not really. Because as well as using uranium in nuclear reactors, then something we've got a lot more of is thorium and we can make thorium reactors we aren't at the moment but we could do and that sort of could be sort of uh, quite useful australia's got the world's largest recoverable reserves of uranium and maybe uh that's going to be useful kazakhstan currently produces however the most uranium from mines in the world and it now seems that you know uranium are we going to run out of uranium no 
not in the short term. And even in the medium term, it's looking less likely. Uh, and if we are, then we just have to move on to different ways of making nuclear reactors. And that we can do really very easily. You've been listening to the Going Green podcast, looking at basically, are we mining ourselves into extinction? And I think our answer to this is no. Well, yeah, like it's more complicated, but essentially no. Yeah. So there may be some scaremongering on some metals, but basically, with a bit of ingenuity, um, the world is known for its ingenuity. We can normally find alternatives so that we won't run out of any materials, metals in the short term, and we won't mine ourselves into extinction. Thank you for listening to the Going Green podcast. We'll be back hopefully next week, if it's nice and warm, uh, for another episode where we'll look into more items that are going green. Thank you for watching and listening and it's goodbye from me and goodbye from me bye bye bye